and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Orly LaBelle, Don Weckstein Professor of Labor and Employment Law at the University of San Diego School of Law. We will discuss her book, You Don't Own Me, How Mattel v. MGA Entertainment Exposed Barbie's Dark Side, which is published by W.W. Norton and Company. So welcome to the program, Orly. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. Well, so I, I read your book last night and I really enjoyed it. I've been looking forward to reading it for a while. And you tell this amazing story about the conflict between two important American toy manufacturers, one a kind of legacy manufacturer and one a much newer one, right? Mattel and, and MGA, the respective manufacturers of the iconic Barbie doll and the much newer and kind of upstart Bratz line of dolls. And, and so I was wondering if you could start by, by talking a little bit about what the nature of the dispute was. In other words, why were these, why were these two companies not just competitors, but sort of litigating uh, ownership or, or rights with each other. W- what happened? So it's a it's a really roller coaster story. And what drew me to tell this story is uh, how uh, litigation played out in the toy industry and with icons, cultural icons that we know so well. Barbie was the fashion doll that dominated the toy industry for decades. And uh, I start by telling the story of what happened when there was a, a new competitor in town, Bratz, and how Mattel finds out through a very interesting kind of sequence of events uh, through anonymous tips that the seed behind this new competitor that for the first time, as Judge Kaczynski writes in his decision on this case, knocks Barbie off her pedestal and and offers real competition in the fashion doll market, Um, Mattel finds out that the seed of that idea comes from a former employee of Mattel who had signed a contract that assigns all of his ideas, all of his inventions to Mattel. Um, But uh, I have to say that the story is um, so unique and, and I think fascinating with colorful Um, characters, but it's also universal. It's really that kind of dynamic of somebody who works for a company and then goes on, moves on, um, has ideas, has a competitive uh, venture. And those kinds of litigations are just really widespread. And so it's it's a, a specific story and it's also a universal story. Yeah, well, I know you've done a lot of work on this area, and it seemed like this particular story must have appealed to you, among other things, because it's such a sort of like to the turn it up to 11 sort of version of a kind of employee looking to be mobile and questions about, you know, trade secrecy and and ownership and so on. And, And like you say, there is this one central figure. Uh, Carter Carter Bryant, who's kind of like fascinating and, and a little bit enigmatic. I, I wonder if you could say a little something about who he was and sort of how he got where he was in Mattel and sort of what what happened. How, how did he come to become such a central figure in this story? Carter Bryant is the unlikely hero uh, that begins our story, but. The book, You Don't Own Me, I see it as a David versus Goliath story that really is um, typical where the David, the the true David that uh, takes us into the courtroom drama and, uh, you know, eventually to to some victories against the corporate giant. He's not Carter Bryant. This is the Isaac Larian, the, the real hero, if you will, of litigation that founds uh, MGA, uh, a competitor, uh, like an entrepreneurship uh, venture, but eventually the the largest uh, privately held toy company in the world. So he's a billionaire, David Carter. Bryant is just a designer. Um, He's like the every man, um, you know, has all kinds of dreams about his creativity, but goes to work for a company, Mattel, that he finds quite stagnant. Um, he feels like it's not very inventive. It's not his dream job. He's 
tasked with coloring Barbie dresses, uh, you know, every few months, just changing a little bit the design. But he also sees a, a product that hasn't been changing for, for decades. And all of his ideas and creativity, he feels is not really used and, you know, by, by the company. And so uh, something that's really fascinating, I think, in the in the book and the, in the litigation that um, happens around this this case is is uh, this question of where does creativity come from? What is the eureka moment where Carter Bryant thinks, you know what, there should be other dolls on the market, Barbie um, has been impossibly perfect. Uh, you know, uh, she represents this all American woman, but really uh, there's been so much critique, uh, from, you know, feminist, um, from, um, the fact that she's traditionally been not diverse at all, not multi-ethnic. Um, she's not been, um, representative of what women's bodies really look like. And he has this idea that we should have for the 21st century dolls that he thinks are bratty, empowered, multi-ethnic, uh, more realistic, more fun for, for the 21st century market, for the 21st century girl that, that wants something different from Barbie. Yeah, and in in the story you tell, he just seems so kind of compulsively creative in this space, and seems really stifled by by the atmosphere at Mattel, where it seems like they sort of want to own everything, but don't necessarily want to use anything. And it struck me as a really kind of interesting sort of cautionary tale about the relationship between innovation, incentives, and and ownership. Absolutely. So that's exactly what happens. Um, and, and this is, I think, exactly how you put it, it has been the um, big motivator of telling the story of whether we're getting it right with incentives, um, with law and policy, and especially with intellectual property and contracts uh, that assign innovation and assign talent to one dominant conglomerate um, that has become stagnant. So it's not only that they're, that Mattel, it turns out, are not very interested in developing new ideas. It's actually what I discovered when I went through all the, the internal memos that were uh, part of the, um, the court records, was that M Mattel was really acting like um, Econ 101 would predict a you know, one dominant actor in an industry to, to act like, which is they were talking about not wanting to cannibalize their prized product. They actually use that word, you know, we don't want to cannibalize Barbie and introduce anything else because she's already selling 90%, you know, she, she holds 90% share of the market. So why would you introduce anything new that would cut away from, the profits that are already, you know, in, in our hands of, of this corporation. And, and that's really, I think what we need to understand that it's always been um, something that's been very interesting to me in my research, the connection between intellectual property, antitrust law, market concentration, um, contractual arrangements, and, and also employment law. So I really see my work as, at, at those intersections and not in just one of those fields. And I think that when you look across those fields, you certainly understand that maybe what we think we got or the bargain that we, you know, struck in, in intellectual property is not working the way that we wanted it to work. Yeah. And I wonder if, you, like, if we could dig a little more into the specific circumstances that you talk about. I mean, the odd situation here is you've got this guy, Carter Bryan, who comes up with a new idea and he wants to take it to someone who actually wants 
wants to do something with it. And, and, and the, the dispute seems to be like, you know, does, does his, do, do his ideas belong to Mattel or can he take the ideas that he comes up with and, and go somewhere else? And I, and I imagine that for a lot of listeners who aren't sort of familiar with how these kinds of employment relationships work and how pe- companies think about intellectual property rights in relation to their employees, it might seem odd to people that, you know, Mattel would have a claim on something that he did outside of work at all. How does that work? <laughs> right. So, so hence the title, you don't own me. That, that has been kind of the puzzle that so many are struggling with it. And again, I, I really want to emphasize that Carter Bryant's uh, agreement, the contract that he signed, the standard generic contract that Mattel provided upon hiring him, which said that everything that he conceives of, develops, improves upon, designs, you know, draws colors, uh, anything, not not necessarily, you know, legalistic terms, but just like the broadest terms um, that they could draft belongs to Mattel. And it says actually in, in his clause, um, whether patentable or non-patentable, whether copyrightable or non-copyrightable, very broad, you know, non-disclosure uh, uh, clause, NDA and, and uh, definition of proprietary information. So this is very typical. I see this because I've been writing about these issues for a while. And, and I wrote about it in my previous book and talent wants to be free. I, I get a lot of emails by like engineers that are um, thinking about joining Google and straight out of college have a job offer there and, and they're looking at these clauses. So we all sign very broad clauses that assign so much of our inventive capacity, pre-assign them to our new employer. And and the question that you just asked, you know, what happens during our so-called free time or supposed, you know, time away from work, that's, that's, again, I think something that's really important for policy to consider. So if you just look at the doctrines that exist in the black letter um, intellectual property pillars, um, you have these doctrines about hired to invent in patent law, you have uh, work for hire and copyright law, and, and they're quite limited. It's, you know, whatever you were assigned to develop, yes, of course, uh, you know, the company then owns. But what about all this creative energy, like you described with Carter Bryant, he, I, I do think that you're right, that he had this um, endless capacity for all sorts of, you know, pretty things that he was drawing since he was a, a little boy, really. He was always sketching something and wanted, you know, he was, he loved fashion. He loved art. He loved, um, it just, uh, angels and, and girls, superheroes. There were a lot, a lot of things. There was a lot of evidence that came out that he was always doing this before he joined Mattel and after he joined Mattel. But, um, the, the, this idea that even when he's, um, what was in in the litigation, it was called the weekends and nights defense. The, even when he was like during weekends, when he was um, off at night at his home, you know, sketching in his sketchbook uh, in, in his bedroom, um, the idea that that too belongs to your employer, I think is, is overreaching. Yeah. And, and, and it, it seems to really get at the way in which we, allow private parties to really contract around or or contract out of a lot of policy that we otherwise make in the abstract in in the IP space is there an argument people make or companies make for why allowing them to contract around the normal kind of distribution of intellectual property rights might be socially beneficial as well as kind of beneficial to the firm itself, trying to just get as much as as it can. Because it seems like the story you describe here makes it seem like this kind of um, really uh, all-inclusive employment contract is not really consistent with with innovation and the generation of new ideas and sort of moving the business forward. Yeah, so this is, a, it's a really tough question. And, you know, obviously, I've um, made the 
the argument that it's it is subverting the um, incentive system that we've struck in intellectual property and and that we have been over expanding and over enforcing these kinds of contracts. But I, I think it's good that you're pushing me on kind of the other side of you know what what is the logic of this expansion that we see so much in every industry and in every position. Um, and, and this is a bundle of clauses. Uh, again, it's important for our listeners to understand that there's lots of these different clauses that together operate to limit people's uh, ability to be creative um, during the time that they're working for an employer and then post employment. So we're talking about non-competes that are really widespread, um, non-solicitation of coworkers and uh, clients after you leave. So if you join an employer, a new employer, you can't call up your former colleague and say, hey, come work for us. Um, clauses that I mentioned, NDAs that are really broad and, and claim more than what uh, the trade secret statutes define as trade secrecy and innovation assignment agreements like what I described with Carter Bryant. So all of those um, really have that effect of creating a, a, a big risk in uh, somebody wanting to do something inventive and creative um, after they've joined an employer and after they've left them. Uh, you know, that's even worse because they don't have that like exit option. Um, so the, the, I think the best argument, uh, supporting the expansion is that, well, contract is contract, right? We, we need to kind of have that freedom of contract for, um, employers to make their employees agree, um, on really broad protections. And, and the argument is similar to, um, the kind of incentive system and in intellectual property in general, that if they have more confidence that they will be able to, Propertize everything that's in the employee's mind. They'll be more motivated to invest in their human capital. They'll be more protected in their R and D investments in general. But the reality is that is that that we have a lot of evidence that um, in the markets, it's really um, empirically shown that it's been impeding this over expansion has been impeding competition it's anti competitive and perversely it has um a lot of negative effects on innovation um because because of exactly mm. what we you know the dynamics like with mattel where you know we have concentrated markets and then we have you know most of us who are employees um rather than owners who are then um, locked in to one particular uh, environment. And, and uh, even when they're discontent, we can't really go on and, and use our inventive uh, capacities elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you, you sort of just sort of alluded to the fact that it seemed like a lot of Mattel employees felt like they didn't have their room to really be creative or the opportunities. I mean, you described so many people who were sort of trying to produce new ideas that seem like, like you said, like they're just not interested in doing something different because, you know, when you have all the market share, you, you don't want to have new products that might distract consumers from your, your one big seller. And, and it struck me that there was this kind of interesting way. And like, I don't know if this is just unique to these two companies or if it's kind of it's indicative of a, of a bigger picture, but it seemed like, you know, the story of Mattel was like the story of these two kind of Jewish immigrant outsiders coming up with this new crazy innovative idea that maybe was a little bit fishy, but they did something new with it. And it was this, you know, unexpected smash success. And then in his own way, Isaac Larian is sort of like another immigrant Jewish outsider from Iran, who's like kind of disrupting the market for for different kinds of toys as well in really interesting ways. And then kind of Carter Bryant seems like kind of an outsider innovator in, in his own way as well. And yet, like, as the companies exist for longer periods of time, it seems like it becomes, or at least in the story that I was, that I, that I read in your book, it, it seems like it just became harder and harder for them to innovate in that same kind of really um, effervescent way that they had in the beginning. Yeah. So I think that's a, a really cool description of um, these dynamics that I think um, 
are are part of the life cycle of companies and industries where um, a lot of companies, um, like if you take Apple and Steve Jobs at the beginning of Apple and its creation and kind of Steve Jobs being such a leader in innovation and has this um, energy, endless energy and vision. And then that life cycle of like, if a company becomes so dominant and, um, and, and large, maybe that some of that is lost and some of the ethics, the corporate ethics change. And you see this in, in the book, you see Mattel losing a lot of that kind of entrepreneurial startup culture that it had and also engaging in all sorts of morally questionable decisions, including being so litigious against any competitor and any artist that challenges their precious Barbie, um, even though most of their cases are losing cases. Um, you know, they go after these artists that are clearly, you know, engaging in fair use and criticizing Barbie and they still litigate against them. So yes, the story, this is again, some of what it drew me to the story. There's, there's a lot of this kind of dynamic of history repeats that behind every great idea, there is somebody that's really thirsty and passionate and maybe somewhat of an outsider. So Isaac Larian and Ruth Handler, 60 years before him, uh, who's uh, also, a, you know, an immigrant rags to riches uh, story. They're both very thirsty and they're the founding CEOs. Uh, but then things kind of change as, as the companies um, become just uh, more successful. And, and in some ways they um, maybe become the, I don't, I don't want to say the victims of their own success, because they are, you know, it's, they're the success of their own success and they um, they enjoy the fruit of, of being so dominant. But I think the, the industry as a whole loses when um, that thirst is, is lost. Mm, mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew that Mattel was litigious, but, but I didn't realize just how litigious until I read your book. I mean, there were actually several cases you discuss in there, like several uh, actions they brought against artists and musicians and so on that I, that I hadn't heard of before. And, and it seemed like there was all, almost this implication that like, like litigation had almost become like a substitute for innovation in some sense. It was like using the courts as a way of trying to manage competition rather than engaging in competition. Yeah, that, 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 that really concerns me. I think it concerns a lot of people who are looking at um, litigious activities around IP and, and other um, areas of law where um, so much resources, so many resources and so much energy is devoted to the courtroom and to using law as a sledgehammer that could have been gone to, you know, devoted to R and D. And yeah, you see this again, I think in, in other industries as well, in pharma and um, in, in tech and financial industries. Um, I think that the, so the, the wall street journal reviewed uh, my book and, and it led by, the just what I describe as the litigation costs in this MGA Mattel case alone, um, it's just astounding numbers that I think most of us are not aware that that just the legal fees that go into such you know big cases. So it was I mean, over. Yeah, go ahead. Correct me if I was like almost a billion dollars. It looked like yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Just the just the legal fees. We're not even talking about, you know, the, what, um, then goes into the, the verdicts and, and the, the fines and the penalties and, and all that. Just, just what, so the, the attorneys are definitely big winners in, in, in these big cases. Um, but that's not innovation. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this particular case was unusual too, in the sense that there were, there were really two full trials, which were, really different in interesting ways. And I, I was wondering, if this, in a nutshell, maybe you could just kind of lay out sort of what happened and this sort of the way the narrative shifted 
between between the two because it seems like the first trial was everything was kind of going in Mattel's favor and there was a kind of normative moral story about Mattel's claims that made it sound like it was in the right and then the second trial seems like it really went entirely the op- opposite direction and i wonder why that is yeah so so part of it i think that what's really fun about this case and i should uh tell you and tell the listeners it's pretty exciting that uh, the book just uh, received an offer uh, to option it to make into a film uh, because I think there's something very uh, cinematic about just the drama that goes on in uh, in the courtroom and part of it is is storytelling exactly like you say um, you know the the strength of attorney is to present uh, um, a narrative in a certain way and, and to shift the jurors opinions. And, and that was, was, was fascinating doing the research for the book. I interviewed the attorneys on both sides. I interviewed the CEOs and the executives. I interviewed the judge, um, and, and jurors. I, I got, it was nice to get access to some of the jurors that, um, we're sitting there in the in the trial, and the case gets tried twice. So you see how much personality matters. Um, there was a different judge um, in in each of the trial um, courts. There was a different team of attorneys because Isaac Larian couldn't pay his uh, previous teams, and and he kept changing um, the teams and and you get a new attorney coming in the second trial who's she's kind of an underdog herself she doesn't come from the world of intellectual property litigation but she really knows how to um tell the story and and um change the the tone so that's part of it part of it is just that um in the first trial there are only the claims of Mattel that um where they're saying Carter Bryan had a contract and then we find out that he develops this idea, sells it to a, a competitor of ours. And so we should own the entire um, brand, this like empire, Bratz empire that was developed by our competitor. We should own the whole thing just because it started from, you know, a breach of a contract um, by, by our former employee. And the judge there, um, I think the way that he guides the jury, um, is is uh something that you know makes a difference and and he he kind of accepts this contract you know a claim and and the jury accepts it there's also when it goes up to uh an appeal to to the ninth circuit court of appeals and judge kaczynski um remands it there's also evidence that the jury itself was um tainted by by uh some uh racial um bias mm-hmm. so um isaac larian is as we said an, an immigrant iranian and and one of the jurors tells the other jurors he must have stolen this idea because all iranians are thieves my husband told me all iranians are thieves <laughs> something like that and judge kaczynski told me when i sat down with him to talk about the case he said oh I, we were kind of glad that we didn't have to look at that problem because we had remanded the whole case anyway on, on the, on the law side, um, because there was, you know, th- there was really not, um, a good understanding of how contract interpretation and how copyright law operates in these questions. And, and he really wanted it to, to be looked at again. And then it comes to, uh, I think a much better judge, uh, judge David Carter, who takes this very seriously, takes the limits of copyright very seriously, takes the limits of trade secrets and trademark very seriously and, and looks at, you know, contract formation and, and the, the, his guidance to the jury makes a, uh, a big difference. But the other thing that makes a huge difference is that, um, at, during that time when, you know, the, this is a long trial and it goes back to a jury trial, uh, MGA finds out about a lot of um, unethical and also uh, unlawful practices by Mattel, and it uh, includes a lot of counterclaims, um, including uh, economic espionage and the toy fairs. Like this is really it's it's the toy industry, but this is what's fascinating about this case. It's like the toy industry, but totally cutthroat. There, um, these. Uh, the, 
people employed by Mattel, they're called the intelligence uh, department. They, they're a whole like espionage team that um, creates fake business cards and fake IDs, fake identities, and they infiltrate the, the toy fairs to try to see what the competitors are doing. And um, there's all sorts of other practices that um, are played out and, and are raised, like, you know, questions about whether toxic toys were recalled on time and um, anti possible antitrust violations. So all of that, again, really shifts the narrative where we see the the big conglomerate that's alleging that somebody stole something from them is really, you know, questionable on, on how they compete in the market. Yeah, it was really quite a turnabout. I mean, like an absolute total victory by Mattel in the first trial, and then an absolute catastrophic yeah. loss. And victory by MGA in the right. second. A real roller coaster. I mean, we don't want to create spoilers because we definitely want everybody to read the case uh, or the, the, book, the book and learn about all these like dynamics of the case. And, and But um, yes, it's like um, there's a lot of excitement <laughs> went in and there's a lot of passion. I mean, the other thing is that you see also the, the, the differences in personalities between the executives on both companies. So Isaac Larian is they, there every day in court and he, he weeps and he cries and he laughs and he talks to reporters and, and he really kind of cares about his, his dolls <laughs> and uh, in some ways personifies mm -hmm. the bratty, empowered, you know, underdog brats um, and the cold CEO of Mattel, who's kind of this professional CEO that eventually actually, um, because of this big loss, he, he, he doesn't continue that path and is ousted, but, um, he, he's like the cold Barbie, right? He doesn't want to be, he's too good to be in, in the courtroom and, <laughs> and he gets a, an order to actually sit there. So there's a lot of human dimension in, in how this plays out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, or Orly, in closing, I mean, I wonder if you could, as you do in the book, reflect a little more broadly on sort of the policy questions that I think the story you tell really highlights. Like, I mean, how how should this story inform the way that we think about how we do innovation, um, how we manage innovation from a policy perspective and how we think about the kinds of contractual relationships between employers and their employees that we're willing to enforce from kind of a public policy perspective. Yeah, no, I mean, it's such an exciting time and I, that's what I write about all the time. I write the, you know, more dry academic, uh, law reviews on, on these issues and I've, um, but they're interesting I think as well. I mean, the, the um, I've been very fortunate to be invited to speak at the White House uh, about um, talent wants to be free, and and now you know you, the work that I've done for you don't own me and and um, other articles. And there is a lot of interest uh, both at the federal level, um, but there are bills before Congress uh, that would. Um, Void most non competes, and um, there is also an interest by the Federal Antitrust Division and the FTC. I was just on the phone with several FTC um, policy uh, people in DC. I was I was on a conference call with them talking about this research, and um, we have a petition to them to to say non competes are impeding in, uh, innovation and their unfair. Um, practices or unfair competition, really, they should be looked at in the same way that consumer contracts uh, that are overreaching uh, should be void. And then also at the state level, there's been a lot of changes. So Washington uh, State, where I was just, I was just had in Seattle speaking at the U.S. District Court there, um, this this weekend they they just passed um, a new bill that would void non competes and and other such practices. Um, and Massachusetts just passed a bill. Hawaii just there's a lot of movement. The focus right now is more on the non competes that so many people sign and um, 
in You Don't Own Me, I tried to extend that logic of wanting more talent mobility and more uh, competitive labor markets also to these other kinds of clauses that I described. So not, you know, not overreaching in the NDA sphere and, um, and understanding the limits of innovation assignment agreements. I think that's, that's the next frontiers. Um, and I think empirical studies uh, that, you know, some of us are engaged in, but also a lot of you know, non um, law academics uh, it's coming out of business schools and econ departments. Those are really, really important so that we get continue to get more and more insights about what are the right lines to draw, just like with the, you know, more pure pillars of intellectual property, we, we should continue to look at how this plays out in, in contract law and in, in industries and markets. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today, Orly. Thank you. It's fun. I'm Barbie. Thanks for inviting me in. You and I have so many things to talk about. You know, I used to wonder what it would be like to go to my first dance, have my very first date, wear my first formal and have a whole wardrobe of pretty clothes. Every girl loves to think about these things. I'm sure you do too. I even like to sing about it. And that's what Ken and I are going to do right now. So listen a while and soon we'll be singing together. Growing up means learning so many different things Like reading, writing, arithmetic, presidents and kings Each lesson is important, believe it or not They taught me almost everything But one thing they forgot I learn how to read a book, learn how to write a letter, but nobody taught me how to fall in love. I learn how to sew and cook, and I learn how to knit a sweater, but nobody taught me how to fall in love. I wonder why did they keep me guessing? I wonder why did they skip this most valuable lesson? Then one day I looked at you, and quick as a flash it happened. Though nobody taught me, I knew what to do. I fell in love like that. With you. Well, I learned how to ride a bike. I learned how to drive a golf ball. But nobody taught me how to fall in love. And I learned how to swim and hike. I learned how to do the cha cha. But nobody taught me how to fall in love. I wonder why did they keep us guessing? I wonder why did they skip this most interesting lesson? Then one day I looked at you, and one look was all we needed. Though nobody taught us, we knew what to do. I fell in love like I fell in love like I fell in love